Good evening. My name is Gail Beebe. I'm president of Westmont College, and on behalf of the entire college community, I'd like to welcome you to this very special exhibition and lecture. Dr. Lisa DeBoer, who is our resident professor of art history, is going to give approximately a half hour lecture on Rembrandt and the 17th century in Amsterdam. The ideas for tonight were a direct result of the generosity of Dr. Howard and Fran Berger. If they would be willing to be acknowledged, I appreciate them at least waving their hand. And, yeah, <laughs> and we also must thank Mr. Michael Schwartz, who was so capable in pulling together all of these prints that helped comprise the Burger Collection and then directing them to the college. Michael, thank you so much. Pleasure. I also wanted to acknowledge Peter and Manny Jacobson, who live across the street from us. We've been neighbors for eight years. And the germ of this evening took uh, began to take root during a Jewish Federation party at their home, to which they invited me. It's our first event with the Jewish Federation, and it was during that time that we began to talk about this evening, Rembrandt and the Jews, private showing, uh, a joint reception with the college and the Jewish Federation. And it's just thrilling to me to be able to welcome you to our campus. And one of the remarks that Judy wrote in preparation of the uh, beautiful exhibition pamphlet that I think both embodies the spirit of 17th century Amsterdam, but I really hope it embodies Santa Barbara and the relationship between Westmont College and the Jewish Federation. Our exhibition tells the story of extraordinary respect and tolerance for outsiders among the citizens of Amsterdam in the 17th century. And it highlights Rembrandt, who boldly wrote with long-established ways depicting Old Testament stories, seeking veracity in all his biblical subjects. The artist counted Jewish intellectuals among his friends and advisors and made portraits of these leaders. To give us a further introduction of the exhibition, please welcome Dr. Judy Larson. Well, thank you, Dr. Beebe, and thank you for everyone. And I'll just add my own personal thanks to um, Dr. Howard Berger and to Fran Berger and to Michael Schwartz because this has just been such a, a pleasure um, working on uh, not just Rembrandt, but to my mind, a, a remarkable story uh, about um, Sephardic Jews who are immigrants to Amsterdam uh, finally reclaiming their Judaism. It's, just, it's a wonderful story, and we're so happy that you shared with us the prints and allowed us to tell that story. Um, I want to thank our um, exhibition sponsors as well, um, and that would um, be include Walter and Darling Hansen, um, and Michael Kidd, and Mary Beth and Jim Vogelsang. Also, our thanks to Sherry and George Isaac, um, as well as Diane Dodd. Um, they made um, the exhibition possible. We're also hosting a symposium on February 28th, so make sure you pick up um, a little postcard about that. Um, that is sponsored by Raymond James in Santa Barbara, as well as Nuna Belverantes and um, Barry Winnick and his wife Linda Sicaccio. So thank you, thank you to all the sponsors who made all of this um, possible. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some thank yous that, oh, I know, I wanted to mention that there's a little companion exhibition to the Rembrandt show. I thought it'd be fun to see what other printmakers were doing in um, 15th and 17th century um, Dutch and Flemish printers, because it's not until you see what the other printers were doing that you realize how special Rembrandt was. So um, from uh, the Perrys, that would be Duane and Faith Perry, alums of Westmont, we have borrowed 16 Dutch and Flemish prints of Old Testament subjects, and you'll see that up in the gallery. Uh, and then on the second level, and you are on the second level, so if you go to the museum through the second level lobby, um, we borrowed uh, 30 photographs by a New York artist named William Castellana. William has taken a series of photographs of Hasidic Jews living in Williamsburg, South Williamsburg, which, is, as you know, is a borough, um, Brooklyn borough of New York. Um, I think they're absolutely wonderful uh, photographs. I think often Hasidic Jews uh, don't like to be photographed, but he has some really telling stories. So um, please enjoy that exhibition as well. Um, I think 
let's just get started with um, Lisa DeBoer, who is my colleague in the art department. Lisa has taught at West Point for 16 years, and I would say she is um, a distinguished professor and a popular professor and a respected one, having twice in her 16 years won the Teacher of the Year award. Um, Lisa is a Dutch 17th century expert, so it was just sort of a natural that we would invite her to write the lead essay um, in the catalog. Uh, she graduated from Calvin College and went on to earn her PhD at the University of Michigan. And uh, she has had prestigious scholarships to name two, the Jacob K. Javits Fellowship from 1990 to 93 and had a Fulbright from 93 to 94. She is a sought-after speaker on her um, specific subject of um, Dutch 17th century. Uh, recently, she spoke at Free University in Amsterdam, and this summer she's been invited to present a paper in Ghent. So um, you're being a world-class scholar in Dr. Lisa de Boer. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for coming. This has to be one of the most fun things I will ever do this semester. I love my teaching, but you're a different audience. <laughs> Although you're sitting just like my students in these sort of awkward chairs that you have to sneak into. Uh, but should you want to talk to each other, they do swivel all the way around. Uh, but our task tonight is the wonderful task of thinking about what we can learn from a historical situation, Rembrandt, an artist living in a cosmopolitan city, hundreds of years ago, interacting with a group of people who uh, have a different faith and a different history and come from different parts of uh, the European cultural context. What can we learn? Well, we are a teaching institution here, and Dr. Howard Berger and Fran Berger have given us this fantastic opportunity to invite people into our learning task through this collection, which they have carefully assembled over the years collecting all of the prints that have to do with people's ideas about Jewish-Christian artistic relationships in 17th century in the Netherlands. So when I saw the film, I thought, wow, they were really pushing the historical record there. Uh, but then I found out they weren't. So that incident really happened. And it testifies to the source of this deep sense of connection between Rembrandt and the Jews in Amsterdam. Um, Dimitri Lainotis played the character of Sam Epstein, who is the monument man who came from Castle, uh, Karlsruhe, whose grandfather donated that Rembrandt self-portrait to the museum in Karlsruhe. And then, of course, once the Nazis came to power, were prevented from actually entering the museum to see it. Uh, the real person to whom this happened was Harry Etlinger, uh, who is documented with that portrait coming out of the mines. Uh, so there is real reason for us to take this relationship seriously. Um, I'm going to give you another reason. Uh, this is a paragraph from the introduction to a book written in 1946 by a Jewish-German art historian who fled Nazi Germany, landed in Cincinnati, and taught at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. He introduced his 1946 book on Rembrandt, the Bible, and the Jews with this paragraph. It has proved a comfort to me in this era of European Jewish tragedy to dwell on the life and work of Rembrandt. Here was a man of Germanic ancestry who did not regard the Jews in the Holland of his day as a misfortune, but approached them with friendly sentiments, dwelt in their midst, portrayed their personalities and their way of life. Rembrandt, moreover, was the first to have the courage to use the Jews of his environment as models for the heroes of sacred narratives. I've frequently referred to these remarkable facts in lectures delivered in Germany and later in America. I have felt it incumbent upon me to convey to others the solace I experience in their contemplation. I desired also to furnish my co-religionists with an understanding of what Rembrandt had done for them and to bring to them a recognition of their debt to his art. Those are truly powerful and poignant words in 1946. So what can we bring out of this history? What can we learn from this history? 
Um, it turns out to be more rich and complex than we might think on the surface. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the history itself, but also the historiography, how the history has been told in shifting interpretive frameworks over time. One of the phenomena that we have to deal with when we deal with Rembrandt is what I call romantic reputation inflation. <laughs> Uh, Rembrandt, over time, became the artist who could do no wrong, the artist who was symbolic of an entire nation, the artist who was the ultimate humanist, the artist who was the ultimate Protestant painter, all of these ultimates labeled on this poor fellow who was just a mortal like you and I. A special one, but a mortal. Now, I am not going to be engaging in sort of a reductivist revisionism, but I hope a respectful revisionism that returns to this remarkable person some of the complexity of what he was negotiating. Um, there have been a lot of uh, takedowns of Rembrandt in the last several years, last 20 years or so, um, to try and recalibrate and reduce the reputation inflation that he inherited from the Romantic era. One of these would be the Rembrandt Research Project. If you're a Rembrandt fan, you've heard of this. It's an attempt to look at every painting in person with a panel of experts and determine, did Rembrandt do it? Did a student do it? Did a follower do it? And put everything in a nice box. Uh, it hasn't turned out so neat, but it's an attempt to recalibrate. Um, publishing all the documents that have to do with Rembrandt's art is another attempt to recalibrate. Uh, scholars have taken various interpretive angles. So Gary Schwartz, a very prolific scholar and a wonderful writer, gives us what we might call the cranky Rembrandt. Uh, Svetlana Alpers gives us the canny Rembrandt, who knows how to manipulate the market. Uh, Ernst von de Wettering, these are all very, very respected scholars, gives us the practitioner, the person who knows the craft really, really well. Similarly, with Rembrandt's relationship to the Jews, <coughs> I'm getting all out of kilter with my slides here. Uh, these are two of the paintings that we believe now can be associated with uh, perhaps actual Jewish sitters. Um, we have skeptics, and among the skeptics we might count the curators of the Jewish Museum in Amsterdam, who a couple of years ago put on an exhibition called The Jewish Rembrandt, The Myth Un Unraveled. Uh, and Gary Schwartz is also a skeptic on this point, and he actually says nothing we know about Rembrandt suggests that he was a friend of the Jews. Uh, then there, on the other side, there is a, a hopeful interpretation, uh, and that would be provided by uh, Stephen Nadler. It's a very fun book to read if you're interested. Uh, Rembrandt's Jews and Michael Zell, Reframing Rembrandt who argue for a very, very close working relationship between Rembrandt and the Jewish community in Amsterdam. Um, and then there are what I would call the optimistic moderates, uh, Larry Silver and Sher Shelley Perlov. And Sher Shelley Perlov is actually one of the speakers who will be coming to our symposium on February 28, who say there are meaningful connections, but they aren't perhaps thick, close, personal, sustained relationships but they're meaningful for Rembrandt's art, and they're meaningful for understanding the religious environment in Amsterdam in the 1700s. So I've taken my lead from these experts who have clearly written the book. <laughs> on um, This book is called Rembrandt's Faith, Church and Temple in the Dutch Golden Age. So now we'll get into some historical particulars. Uh, we'll skip over that. That was a point that the moment came and went. <laughs> Rembrandt's neighborhood. One of the reasons why Rembrandt's relationship with the Jews came to be imagined as so thick and rich and dense and um, permeating every aspect of his life is that in the 18th century, the neighborhood where Rembrandt lived was a predominantly Jewish neighborhood and also a predominantly impoverished neighborhood. So this is all of Amsterdam, and you can see how the city grew. This is the uh, old core here, and then it spread out in this direction. And then they gave the so-called uh, girdle of canals that were eventually built out. Uh, in Rembrandt's neighborhood, his street is right here. And this area over here was um, the Floyenberg, where a lot of Jewish residents lived. On this street here, this was a newer neighborhood where lots of middle-class merchants settled. There were a lot of artists who lived on that street, and there were a lot of Sephardic Jews who lived on that street. These were the Jews who came from Spain and Portugal, sometimes by way of France, and then they were kicked out of France 
And they had lived as Christians for generations. They had been forced to go underground with their faith. And when they arrived in Amsterdam, they were allowed to reclaim their faith. They, they started three different synagogues. Uh, but they continued to dress like Dutch people dressed. Uh, they were not required to live in particular neighborhoods. They were not required to signal their faith with any item of clothing, which was common elsewhere in Europe. Um, but they did tend to congregate, as people do, with people like them along this street. Uh, so that's this street right here. And this is the house Rembrandt bought in the late 1630s and lived in for about 20 years. So this was a prosperous middle class mixed neighborhood with a good representation of Sephardic Jews when Rembrandt lived there. There was also a population of poorer Jews from Eastern Europe, Ashkenazim, who settled in this neighborhood over here. And the Ashkenazim outnumbered the Sephardic Jewish population by many times, many uh, orders of magnitude, and were an interesting contrast. Uh, they were by and large uneducated, by and large quite poor, but had a close um, engagement, practice, language of faith that the Sephardic Jews were trying to reclaim. So there were some class differences and there were some cultural differences that made the Sephardic Jews more likely to be patrons and the Ashkenazim more likely to be models. Curious people who dressed differently and added to the flavor of the city and caught artists' eyes uh, as models, not just Rembrandt. So that's a little bit about the geography of Amsterdam. This would be an example of one of the Sephardic Jews who had a relationship with Rembrandt commissioned a portrait. This is upstairs in the museum. You'll get a chance to see it shortly. Here's an example of what uh, scholars are fairly confident in thinking a little drawing by Rembrandt of a couple of Ashkenazim having a conversation on the street, which may have been a model for the uh, print also up in the exhibition, Jews in the Synagogue. Now, another phenomenon that we have to take into account, in addition to the changing nature of the neighborhood, when Rembrandt lived there, it was a prosperous street. Fifty years later, when his prints are being collected and the catalogs are being written, it's a different, even the street name changes. The street name changes to the Jodenbreestraat, so it becomes named for the population who lives there. Uh, we also have in the end of the 1600s and the beginning of the 1700s a rise in ethnographic interest. So we have people coming to the Netherlands and looking at Amsterdam and what's going on there. And one of the curiosities that people go see are the Jewish people in Amsterdam. So we know that John Evelyn, an intellectual from England where the Jews had been expelled in 1290 already, came to see the Jews in Amsterdam, was really intrigued with what he saw. We have an artist like Emmanuel de Witte knowing that he'll have an audience for a painting of the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. And we have a very important book. If you're an anthropologist, this is a really important book. S Religious Ceremonies of the World, including Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, all the known religions, but also as people's sense of the world is expanding, new and exotic religions as well, illustrated. So Bernard Picard's prints, this is the same synagogue, Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, showing up in this ethnographic study of religious practices around the world. So there's a growing interest in seeing connections between art, Rembrandt's art in particular, and Judaism. And this uh, tendency grows and grows and grows, such that by the early 20th century, Abraham Bradius, who is one of the dominant Rembrandt experts, can claim that one-fifth of Rembrandt's portraits of male sitters are Jews. Um, and that is a factor of all of these historical currents coming together. And when we go back and drill down into the documents, look at what the street and the neighborhoods were actually like when Rembrandt lived there, we probably have to temper that quite a bit. Um, so here we have uh, a portrait that is perhaps Manasseh ben Israel, but scholarly opinion now holds that very lightly and says it might be another rabbi, it might be a Mennonite preacher. So we've had to back off of some of these enthusiastic attributions. Uh, here are another couple of pictures that got swept up in the enthusiasm for making these connections and with a little bit more sober attention and historical context setting, 
uh, the great Jewish bride who shows up in an 18th century catalog as a Jewish bride uh, is probably Esther, Old Testament historical figure, so still connected with Hebrew scripture, but in a narrative context that would make sense in the Netherlands because of something I'll talk about in just a second. Here is the uh, so-called little Jewish bride uh, who is actually um, clearly St. Catherine. Uh, she has her attribute, the wheel that was used to torture her in her martyrdom right there. So this just gives you a sense for the enthusiasm and then having to sort of tamp that down a little bit in order to pay attention uh, to the history. Now, why would we have connections in the first place? Um, one thing that we can acknowledge here, and we'll go back to um, our Esther, very likely Esther, is the overlap between Calvinist ways of reading Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament, and the presence of Jews in Amsterdam. They would have had um, purchase on Dutch people's sense of their own providential history. So it was very common for historians, Christian historians in the Netherlands, to claim that the Dutch people were like the ancient Hebrews who had been liberated from the yoke of slavery in Egypt, just like the Dutch were liberated from the yoke of oppression of Spain. So all over the place, you see this crossover in the interpretation of the 17th, 16th and 17th century Dutch experience and the ancient Hebrews experience of liberation out of the house of bondage and the land of slavery. Uh, and that's where the story of Esther would come in. So there's that natural connection. Um, Simon Shama, who's always good for a classy turn of phrase that catches your ear, uh, writes about this as follows. If Amsterdam was another Jerusalem, and the Republic truly was a land flowing with milk, certainly there's a lot of milk in the Netherlands, if not honey, uh, the Dutch imagined that there was already a chosen people occupying it, whose history and destiny had marked them out as the true inheritors of the covenant. So while that explains some of Rembrandt's interest in Hebrew scriptures and all of the history of Israel throughout time, um, it doesn't necessarily make it a copacetic overlapping of the Jewish sense of what that meant and the historical Dutch political sense or uh, theological sense of what that meant. So here we get to some more interesting convergences. Millenarianism. How does providence work in history? I am not an expert in this area, but the people who have studied the theological, both Jewish and Christian theology, are in agreement that around 1650 there were very, very high millenarian hopes, both in the Jewish community and in the Christian community. And the point of contact there for the Jews and the Christian scholars was understanding Hebrew scripture, interpreting and unpacking. So the Christians came to the Jews to learn the Hebrew, and then they talked together. I am very curious about what those conversations would like. I would love to know more about the substance of what seems to me like a kind of early modern interfaith dialogue, mm -hmm. where the Jewish goal is to spread the Jews throughout the four corners of the world because that is what needs to happen before the Messiah can come. The Christian goal is to convert all of the Jews because that is what happens before the Messiah will come again. <laughs> so both of them had deep, profound hopes for the consummation of history. Their version of what that consummation of history looked like was different, but they could gather together around a, a shared positive vision for God's intervention in human history and their need to unpack this really ancient and complex book. So we have evidence of Christian and Jewish scholars corresponding with each other over interpretations of particular words and particular passages. And that's where we get something like this. So Manasseh ben Israel writes a millenarian text, uh, a kind of mystical text, and gets Rembrandt to do illustrations for it. So this comes from the book of Daniel, an apocalyptic book, interpreting uh, the dreams of Daniel. And these are some of the most enigmatic prints I have ever seen. Uh, the set that um, has been collected by the Burgers is printed on vellum. 
Rembrandt experimented with lots of different printing surfaces. This is not printed on paper, so when you get up to the museum, take a close look. It's printed on calfskin, which uh, means the ink takes differently on the surface. And this might be Rembrandt's answer from the Christian side of the millenarian debate, uh, the triumph of Mordecai. And Shelley Perlove actually has a lovely article just on this print unpacking the significance of the inclusion of the temple and this design of the temple and how that would fit in a different interpretive framework for the coming of the millennium and the place of all of the Jews of the world in that particular consummation of history. So again, wonderful. We can go upstairs and see this in just a minute. Um, here is an example of the political appropriation of Hebrew history for contemporary Dutch purposes. It's our amazing stained glass windows in the Cathedral of Gouda. Um, here is contemporary history, the liberation of the city of Leiden from the Spanish. Broke, break the dikes, flood the fields, get the Spanish out of the, out of the siege works around the city or they'll drown. Miraculous divine intervention. Obviously God is on their side. Parallel to the miraculous lifting of the, the, the army outside of the city of Samaria just disappears uh, and the Jews are rescued. This is an Old Testament topic parallel to a contemporary event. So this would be a nice example of um, how history made a lot of room for Old Testament stories. But if we also think carefully about Rembrandt's part in this relationship, we start to see what he's doing with the pictures. And this is what really interests me. Um, I am an art historian who grew up in a Calvinist tradition. Calvinism has a vexed history with the, with the arts. Uh, there was a bad period in the 1500s, 1566 to be precise, where probably some of my ancestors rampaged through churches, lopping the heads off of statues, breaking the beautiful stained glass windows, burning the altarpieces, um, because that was seen to be idolatry. Rembrandt, however, is an artist to the bone, and he figures out how, even in this Protestant setting, to make the pictures theologically significant. All of the scholars make this point. It's a point that I love to make to my students. There are things pictures can do that words cannot. Uh, pictures can make immediate visual connections that you take in viscerally before you even know you've taken them in. Now, if we pay careful attention to Rembrandt, we can see, I can't show you all the examples, but I'll just show you one, of how he takes a topic from Hebrew scripture and interprets it from his Protestant perspective, heavily influenced by the writings of John Calvin. So Calvin claims that all, revela all revelation comes through Christ. So everything, even in Hebrew scripture, Old Testament, all of it is facilitated by the person of Christ. It's obviously a deeply Christian interpretation of revelation. Here we have Abraham entertaining the angels unawares, uh, where the covenant is proclaimed. You're going to have a child. You don't think you're going to have a child, but you're going to have a child. Uh, I will keep my promise to you. So here's Abraham. Here's Sarah. Uh, here's Ishmael and the three angels. Um, in unpacking this print, Perloff and Silver note that this headpiece is a headpiece that Rembrandt uses to designate priests. He, sh he uses it for Simeon in the New Testament story of Jesus being brought to the temple to be dedicated as a baby. Um, for a long time, Christians have interpreted these three angels as a manifestation of the Trinity, but Rembrandt's getting a little more specific. And then look what he does. The priestly figure is holding a chalice in one hand and gesturing toward a salver of unleavened bread in the other. This is a prefiguration of the Eucharist, way, way, way back in Genesis. So it's a deeply theologically inflected Christian read of a topic from Hebrew scripture. And this is what leads Perlov and Silver to their more moderate read that Rembrandt is not on board with the Jewish millennial project, but is interested and associated with it from his own particular faith perspective. So that would be one example of visual theology happening through the pictures. Um, lastly, before we go upstairs, I just want to alert some of you to the mechanics of printmaking. 
Those of us who deal with art are used to this stuff, but those of us who don't deal with art every day, it's new. And it's fascinating, and it's actually mind-bending. So the processes that Rembrandt used are these over here, intaglio, uh, particularly etching, because etching most clearly reproduces the drawing gestures of the hand. I'm going to send around a copper plate. This is a modern copper plate, and my printmaking instructor, Megan Sterling, told me to tell you if you know anything about printmaking, these are examples of bad lines. So <laughs> don't think this is a good plate. But these are the tools you would use. Uh, this gets covered with a layer of acid-resistant ground, and then you draw through it with this sharp, pointy needle. If you don't like what you do after you see the result, you can scrape part of the print out with this very nasty tool, which is extremely sharp. Be careful as I pass it around. You can scrape the plate down, and then you take the burnisher and you make the surface smooth again. Then you can cover it with the resist, draw through it again, and make a different picture. And Rembrandt did that very, very cannily. So he would have multiple states of his editions so that printer, print, make, print collectors would want all of them. So I'll start over here because these two know what they're <laughs> looking at. So you can look at a small plate. And these are all etched lines here. So these are created by lightly scraping away the acid-resistant ground and then the plate goes in acid, and where the resistant ground has been scraped away, the acid bites into the plate. Um, you get different kinds of lines with different kinds of processes. You also need different kind of printing presses for these different processes. Um, I could say more about that, but in the interest of time, I won't. Judy mentioned that Rembrandt is a different sort of printmaker from most other 17th century printmakers. You'll see the difference when you look at the entry gallery and the Rembrandt prints. This would have been a very common use for printmaking in the 17th century, reproductive printmaking. For a short period of time at the beginning of his career, Rembrandt experimented with hiring printers to reproduce his paintings. So Joris von Fleet here gives us uh, the woman reading the Bible. Uh, and this reminds me that the challenges of printmaking are thinking like a negative, black and white, and thinking in reverse. So your composition, we scan from left to right the way we read. That's how we make sense of a composition. When you're engraving a plate, you have to reverse that in your mind and figure out how to make a good composition, drawing from right to left. Rembrandt also was an avid collector and very, very aware of his own illustrious Northern European print tradition. So someone like Lucas von Leiden, Henrik Holtzius, Albrecht Dürer treated printmaking as an artistic form in its own right. Rembrandt recognized that, assiduously collected these guys, and then would comment on them. So same topic, um, Hagar and Ishmael being thrown out of the house, Lucas von Leiden, and Rembrandt chooses a slightly different moment and a slightly di different emotional tenor, but he knows exactly what Lucas von Leiden did before him. And I mentioned being able to rework the plates. That can be a commercial strategy to increase the number of editions that people want to collect, but it also can be a devotional strategy. And here we come back to the topic of pictures as theological tools, not just words, but pictures. Uh, so this is Rembrandt's three crosses, which he worked and worked and worked and printed in a number of different states, each with a different emotional valence. And there's some very nice writing on what might have been his own internal journey as he was working on these prints. Uh, we can also see the issue of different states very clearly in the uh, glorious stone series that he did for Manasseh ben Israel's text. But now I have talked long enough. And you get to go upstairs and look at all of these. And if you have any questions, I'll be upstairs and you can just uh, approach me. I'd be delighted to talk with you more. <laughs>